Price, that's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Welcome back. I'm Hayden Brain, and you're listening to Watto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. This week, I spoke to Morgan Housel. Morgan is a partner at the Collaborative Fund, a firm responsible for over $300 million, a former columnist at The Motley Fool and The Wall Street Journal, and crucially for today's interview, the award-winning author of The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed and Happiness. Morgan's insight into how the human mind thinks about this well-trodden topic are truly unique, as he busts some well-established myths by telling the stories of investing and business greats, including... Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jesse Livermore, and many more that you've probably never heard of. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Morgan. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. How's your week been so far? It's, it's good so far. We're still Monday morning here, so it's still early into it, but thanks for having me today. I'm excited. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, so I wanted to start by introducing your book, The Psychology of Money, just to give the listeners an idea of what it's all about. And then we'll uh, move on to talk a little bit about your background, uh, just to set the rest of the interview in, in context. Um, but it, as, as far as I'm aware, I, I read the book um, just before our interview. So I sort of finished reading it end of last week. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, it, it tells 19 short stories, essentially, exploring the various ways in which people think about money. Uh, and interestingly, for me anyway, the narrative quickly identifies the fact that in investing, perhaps more so than in any other industry, things like education and connections c- can often actually count for nothing. And I was interested to know if there was a specific moment or time that saw you come to that conclusion or you know, was there a specific thing that sparked that idea? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, there actually was a specific moment. And I, I, I'm i actually hesitant to say specific moment because it took me a while to, to piece this together. But my writing career really began in 2008. That's when I started as a full-time writer. And today, of course, was the great financial crisis when the global economy nearly collapsed, the financial system nearly collapsed. So a lot of my early years as a writer were devoted to answering the question, why did this happen? Why did the financial crisis happen in the way that it did? Why did people make the decisions that they did? Why, you know, have we learned anything? Those are the questions I was trying to answer. And I realized that the answer to those questions could not be found in an economics textbook. There was nothing in an economics textbook that could have explained why people made the decisions that they did leading up to and during the financial crisis. But I realized over time, and again, it was, it was a slow realization, but I realized the answer to some of those questions could be found in a psychology textbook and a sociology textbook and a history textbook and a political science textbook, those kind of things. And I'm, I'm using the word textbook there, but just in terms of you know just viewing the world through a lens of those fields, you could start to explain why people made the decisions that they did. So that was a realization to me that um, you know, what really matters in investing and in finance is not what you know. It's not about how smart you are, the analytical skills that you have. And it's not that analytical skills don't matter. But what is really important is that if you have analytical skills, but you do not have behavioral skills, the lack of behavioral skills can uh, neutralize any of the analytical skills you have. Because think going into the financial crisis, you could be the smartest financier in the world. You can have all the analytical intelligence, a PhD in finance from Harvard. Uh, But if you panicked in 2008, if you panicked in March of 2020 this year, or if you panicked in 2000, uh, none of the analytical skills matter. Like you have to have the behavioral part down before the analytical side means anything. Um, You know, it's it's very similar to, you you can imagine something in medicine where you can have, you can be the smartest doctor in the world have all the medical knowledge that exists in humanity, if you can have all of it in your head. But if you don't have control over your own personal uh, diet, exercise, whether you smoke or not, then none of your medical knowledge necessarily matters if you don't have control over your own personal behavior for those things. So I think it's very similar in finance. Yeah, and I guess a kind of logical kind of next step or natural conclusion that I then took for that, and uh, I explained before the call, we've got a lot of uh, retail and sort of individual traders listening in, was that they could essentially be buoyed and boosted by this hypothesis. Yeah, I think that's right. Because typically when investors think about risk, they think about 
what is going to happen to me? What is the stock market going to do to me? What is the economy going to do to me? That's how they view risk. I often think like a much better view of risk is what we do to ourselves. It's our own biases, our own misconceptions, our own impatience, our own uh, relationships of greed and fear. And I think at first glance, that can actually be disheartening for people to hear that you are your own worst enemy in investing. I feel like they don't want to hear that. But to me, it's actually a really optimistic realization. Because when you realize, you know, of course, you have no control of what the stock market is going to do next. You have no control of what the economy is going to do next, what politicians are going to do next. You can't control any of that. All you have to do, the only thing that you can control in investing, whether you are a trader or a long-term investor, is your own decisions, your own behavior, your own view of the world. And I think when you realize how important behavior is, that it is such a fundamental part of long-term investing success, that when you realize the only thing that you can control is actually the thing that matters most, that's actually pretty optimistic. I think when you view that in in one way, it makes it seem like the outcomes are much more in your control than they otherwise feel like they are if you view risk as just what's, you know, what is the market going to throw at you? I think that's a pretty optimistic realization. And I think it's been optimistic for me personally as an investor uh, to just like shift my, my viewpoint and be like, okay, look, I'm a long-term investor. My whole, my only goal as an investor is to remain invested for the next 30 or 40 years to let the money compound. That's all I want to do. So once I, once I do that, then it's like, okay, I, I, you know, what the stock market does this year or what the economy does, does not matter to me at all. Like it's just not relevant to how I invest. Um, But what is relevant to how I invest is can I remain patient and hands off and accept uncertainty and volatility for the next 40 years? And that's all on me. Like what the economy does or the stock market does doesn't really matter. This is all on me. This becomes much more of a personal endeavor that I have control over versus just being at the mercy of whatever the market might do to you. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And that's something that comes across really well in the book that, you know, it's it's essentially within your own capability and you have that responsibility to grow your investment and grow grow your capital. I mean, what was interesting to me as well, you use an example of a guy called Ronald Reed, and uh, I'll, I'll leave you to explain who, who that is. But he seemed anyway to me as an outlier you know these sorts of people that are outperforming the big institutions by themselves uh, simply by investing their own money like we don't maybe maybe it's that we don't hear that much about it or it's simply that there are few of these people relative to the massive sort of institutions that we all know and and, and hear about i mean what, what's your take on that are there a few out there or is it simply that we just don't hear about them i i, I definitely think it's the latter that we don't hear about them i mean if you look at how much money is invested like the the average investor in the united states i, I should say this is this is through my my own my own perspective of investors in the united states the majority of investors the average investor uh dollar cost average into their 401k Every paycheck, they leave it alone. They don't even know the password to their four, to their 401k. They just keep investing and they leave it alone and they never check it. You never hear stories about those investors because it's not exciting. You hear stories about the people who knocked it out of the park or who went bankrupt or you know the, the extreme ends of the spectrum. But the majority of invested capital in the United States is actually invested in a very long-term, hands-off, appropriate manner, in, in my view. And you don't hear about those people because they're not exciting. Ronald Reed is, of course, an extreme example, to give you a little more, more background. And then Ronald Reed was uh, one of the most humble guys you could ever imagine. He worked his entire career as a janitor and a gas station attendant. His friends who knew him said his only hobby that they could remember was chopping firewood. Just the most like down-to-earth humble, non-exciting, nondescript guy that you can imagine. And when he died, he left, uh, I think, $7 million to charity. Um, And his friends who knew him said, where did this gas station attendant get $7 million? And they dug through his papers, they dug through his, uh, you know, all of his, his finances, realized that there was no secret. There was no inheritance, there was no lottery winnings. All he did is he took what little money he could save from working as a gas station attendant, he invested it in blue chip stocks, and he left it alone for like 60 years. That was it, that's all he did. Now, that's an extreme example to actually let it grow to that much without taking anything out, without cashing out and buying a house, uh, something like that. So he is an extreme example, and I I make that point clear in in, in the book. But I think just the fact that his story is even possible makes it realize that that investing is something that is more in your control because it is impossible to think of Ronald Reed, you know, performing open heart surgery, uh, you know, doing something really complex that re- that does require a lot of analytical skills. It would just never happen in a million years that some, you know, old country bumpkin could could, could perform open heart surgery. No, no, that would never happen. But it does happen in finance where people who have no background, no education, no skills, no training can do well. And it's not just luck. Like that could be part of the equation, but it's not just what it is. Because what we know is that Ronald Reed had mastered 
the behavioral side of investing, whether he even knew it or not. I think it was just part of his innate personality. Uh, but he had mastered that. He had mastered his relationship with greed and fear. He mastered long-term thinking. He mastered diversification, mastered patience. And that was all, that's all you need to do well over time. So even if his analytical skills were at best mediocre, when you combine that with mastering the psychology side, you can get a really good result in investing. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's such a fascinating story. And there's, there's loads of stories like that within, within the book. So I really do encourage people to, uh, to seek it out. Uh, and we're going to return to uh, the book shortly. I just want to uh, dig into your background for anyone that isn't familiar with your work, uh, just to understand you know, what's influenced your career thus far, how you've made it to where you are today. Um, so firstly, you've spent a lot of your career writing, first at the Wall Street Journal uh, and then at the Motley Fool. Uh, so has this always been a, a passion of yours? It's, it's, it's always what I've done. Uh, it's, it's the only thing I've ever done. And the, the order of those was, was actually flipped. I started at the Motley Fool when I was a junior in college. So it's truly the only job. I started full time when I was a junior in college writing. So it's truly all I've ever done in my career, even before I graduated uh, college, was writing about finance, writing about the economy, writing about about investing. And that was never part of the plan. I didn't, I didn't set out to become a financial writer. It just kind of happened by accident. I kind of stumbled into it serendipitously. Never, and, and even when I started doing it, I thought, okay, I'll do this for a couple months before I find another job in private equity or in investment banking, which is what I wanted to do. So it was never part of the plan, but I really did fall in love with the process of writing. Writing, I, I think, is more than about communication. Writing is a way to clarify your thinking like it's more that it's not it's not just a communication process it's a thought process in a way that I didn't know at the time but I really fell in love with it in terms of just like taking a vague unstructured gut feeling in your head and when you force yourself to put it on paper that idea becomes a lot more crystallized for better or worse sometimes it becomes crystallized and you realize that the idea was ridiculous and sometimes you crystallize it and you're like oh now now I'm making sense of these vague ideas that I had in a way that's very helpful now so I really liked the process of writing, and that's that's all I've ever done now for uh, you know I guess twelve years now, and, and that, that, that's all I ever want to do. I work at a venture capital private equity firm, but all I do is write and speak because that's all I want to do. That's where that's where, that's what gets me up in the morning. Uh, you know, a lot of people in this field get up in the morning because they love trading, they love investing. It's not that I don't like investing, but I think my real passion, my first passion, is writing about investing. Yeah. Okay. So in particular then within the sort of investment space, what do you most enjoy writing about? Could you narrow it down to one thing? I mean, I, I'm always interested in the intersection between investing history and investing psychology, like the history of how people have dealt with uncertainty and greed and fear. And what can we learn about that history to become better investors, better thinking about finance in a more productive way ourselves? That's what I'm most interested in. Um, so it's less about, it, it, or I have to say, it's virtually nothing about what's going on in the news today or this week or even this year. It's more about like, let's look at the last hundred years and what are the big common denominators that always come up about how people think about greed and fear and what can we learn from those? Because the more applicable something is across history, the more likely... Uh, the, the more confidence we can have that it's going to be part of our future. Like if you look back at the last hundred years and you find something that comes up in the 2000s and the 1960s and the 1940s and the 1920s, you find these common denominators about how people think about risk and the mistakes that they keep making throughout different era, different countries. That, that's when you know you have discovered something that is going to be part of our future that you can put a lot of confidence in to say, okay, if I can master this topic and become acutely aware of this topic, then I'm then I'm likely going to have you know be better off in the future knowing that's part of of that that's going to be part of my future which is not necessarily true if we're talking about you know uh, what industries are doing well or what companies are doing well it's not that that's bad it's a, all you know it's not necessarily timeless like so much of what happens in the economy and investing markets changes over time and adapts over time that's the whole history of economics is change and adaptation and technology and advancement. So I'm, I'm actually most interested in the things that never change this is what we can put a lot of effort into for our forecasts. And I think this is a lot of why forecasting in general in the investing field has such a poor track record. It te forecasting tends to be very difficult if you are trying to forecast things that change. Like what's, what's the stock market going to do, do this year? What is going to be the best industry next year? All those things change and adapt over time. Whereas I think if you can focus on something more fundamental to human behavior, like our relationship with greed and fear, uh, our inability to take a long-term mindset and our, our, our patience, our impatience, those kind of things, that is something that is timeless. And I think if you focus those on part of your 
uh, forecasting, so to speak, you can have a better sense of what's likely to happen to you and everyone else in the future. Yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. And I guess why that formed the foundation for your book. I mean, I can really see how that that process has worked out. And, and that really comes to life in the book as well. Um, and you kind of mentioned it at the top of your answer there. Um, you're a partner at the Collaborative Fund. Um, and I just wanted, before we move back onto the book, uh, to give you a chance to sort of tell people what you're doing there. I mean, in particular, something that struck me as particularly interesting on your website was this aim and I'm, I'm kind of reading verbatim here but to exploit the intersection of the ideas that are better for the individual or better for me but better for the world as well so you can tell us about how you aim to do that well i think it's this idea you know the idea of impact investing in terms of using your investment dollars to do a little bit better in the world that idea has been around for a long time uh, but historically, it has typically been seen as kind of a flavor of philanthropy. So yeah, you're investing in these quote unquote good companies, but you might at best get your money back. You're not doing this to maximize your returns. You're doing this because you want to uh, look yourself in the mirror and sleep well at night. That's why you're doing it. And I, I think our twist on that, our, like we're, it's not that we disagree with that. But we do think there is a flavor of companies. There is, a, there is a universe of companies who can use their ability to do good in the world as an economic competitive advantage using their ability to do something good in the world to attract the most loyal customers, the best employees, uh, that kind of thing in a way that's actually going to be an economic competitive advantage for them. I mean, I mean here's, here's one big example. Think about the Toyota Prius and the Tesla Model S. The Toyota Prius is basically just better for the world. It's doing good for the environment, and that's great. There's a big market for people who want that um, because it has lower emissions, et cetera. But it's not a sports car. It's not a beautiful car. It's not a fast car. That's, they're not even trying to, to make that part as a selling point. When Toyota sells it, they say the Toyota Prius is better for the environment, and that's why you're, that's it. But think about the Tesla Model S. It is also better for the environment. It's zero emissions, et cetera, et cetera. But it is beautiful. It's just a sports car. It's incredibly fast. It's something that people want to brag about. You know, it's right up there in terms of looks with maybe even a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. But it also does better for the world. That is the kind of company that we are after. The kind of company who use their ability to do better without making consumers sacrifice to get that better uh, factor in the world. Those are the companies that I think that we think are going to do best over the coming generations. As consumers have so much more information about how companies operate and how products are produced and how companies treat their employees. As consumers have more information about those things, they become much more willing to say, okay, they are only, you know, I am only going to spend my consumer dollars at companies whose values align with my own. So if you can have those companies in a way that does not make consumers sacrifice the product, their, make, make a sacrifice to enjoy the product, that's when you can get some big home runs. I mean, one other example is something like veggie burgers, which have been around for decades, of course, but they never tried to actually compete with a hamburger. You had Boca burgers or veggie burgers that were barely palatable at times. And they did not try to, you know, if, if you wanted to eat these because you wanted to be healthier, do better for the world, you had to sacrifice. You're not going to get the delicious juicy burger that, you, that other people would. And then you have companies that came along like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, which we were both investors in, who basically said, look, you, you can have both. You can have the veggie burger that is doing better in the world, but we're not going to make you sacrifice the delicious taste and the juiciness and the bleedingness that comes from a real, a real burger. We're actually going to do it in a way that, that, that captures both ends of that. And both those companies, of course, are doing incredibly well because of it. Because you know, a, a big portion of those, of those companies' customers are not vegetarians. They're people who really enjoy and want the taste of a juicy, delicious burger, but also have a side of them that says, hey, if there's a better, more sustainable way we can do this, that's the one that we want. So I think when you get both of those sides, that's when you really get exponential growth and opportunity. Yeah, completely. It's such a sort of simple and yet really useful uh, investing framework. Or like, I, I guess I imagine it as a Venn diagram. And it's, again, like that intersection between the two that and that's where the, the, the kind of great opportunities are for the long term. So, yeah, hopefully really useful for the people listening in. Um, and I guess, as I promised then, I wanted to return to your book. Um, we've already discussed it. Uh, behavior rather than knowledge or experience is, is kind of addressed as um, all important, really, within the book, or at least that's the way it's positioned. I mean, firstly, could you clarify exactly why it is that you think behavior more so than the experience one can get from investing in global markets what why is that more important well, again it, it, it's not that behavior is the is the only important thing it's just that if you don't if you mix 
good analytics, you know, good intelligence with bad behavior, the bad behavior is what shines through. It's, it's not that the behavior matters more than anything else. It just has the ability to neutralize any sort of analytical intelligence. Um, and as people like Ronald Reed show, that is not true in the reverse. So, so again, if you have all the analytical intelligence, but not the behavior, you're, you're, you're going to lose. If you have all of the behavior, but none or just a little bit of the analytical intelligence, you can still do very well. So it's just kind of like the order of operations in those things that makes behavior so fundamentally important. And it's not that analytics don't matter and, uh, or, or that I'm poo-pooing it. I mean, a lot of what we have learned about finance and economics from the analytical side in the last century, just in terms of something so fundamental like discounted cash flows, which we didn't really understand before the 1930s, or you know, the, the amount of increase we've had in information and technology and financial models uh, has been really incredibly important. And if you go back and read about what investors, how investors thought 100 years ago, we really did not understand the analytical mechanism of how finance works, about how you should value a company, you know, what is the right capital structure. For, we just really didn't understand a lot of that stuff. And we do now, so that's great. Um, but I think a lot of finance stops right there. And they view finance like it is something like physics, where if you understand the analytics, that's all you need to know. And if you understand them, you can be kind of master of the universe. Uh, because it doesn't matter if you, know, if you are a very emotional physicist. It doesn't matter. If you understand the math, then you get it. Then That's all that matters. So I think what, to the extent that we view finance like it is physics, that's where we tend to go astray. And we have to view it, I think, as something where it is physics with an emotion. And you have to have both sides of that in order to do well over time. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. In writing the book, were you able to identify consistent behavioral traits among those that outperformed the wider market? Were there any that stuck out? I mean, I, I think the, the one, one thing that's important is that it's different for, for everyone. So the behaviors and the emotions and the flaws that I have are going to be very different from the ones that you have. But I think, you know, for, for uh, I think a lot of people, one big one in investing is just this observation that you know, anything good in life that you want in life has a cost. You want a nice house, there's a cost to that. You want a nice car, there's a cost to that. And in investing markets can deliver something amazing. They can, div- they can make you wealthy over time. And just like anything else, there is a cost to that. There is a fee that you have to pay. And it's not an observable fee. It's not like someone sends you a bill that you pay with your credit card. So since it's not observable, we don't tend to think that it's there. But there is a very obvious fee in investing. And to me, the most common fee for investors is putting up with and dealing with uncertainty and volatility. That is the cost of admission to doing well in financial markets over time. And I think a big flaw, a big bias, I would say, that is a common denominator for a lot of people is that they tend to view volatility not as a fee, they view it as a fine. What I mean by that is a fee is something that you are willing to pay in order to get something more valuable in return. If I go to Disneyland, there's a fee at the admission gate. I'm happy to pay that fee because it's going to get me something that I want that I want on the other side. There's no problem. A fine is something that you are supposed to avoid. If you get a fine, you got in trouble. You got a speeding ticket. You're not supposed to do that. Bad boy, don't do it ever again. Uh, you know, I hope you learned your lesson. That's what a fine is. And I think when people view volatility as a fine, their portfolio goes down 10% and they say, oh, I, get, you know, I, I clearly did something wrong. This was a mistake that I need to learn from. Um, that can get you into a lot of trouble versus I think viewing that as a fee and saying, look, I don't, I don't enjoy when my portfolio declines 10%, but I view that as the cost of admission, the worthwhile cost of admission to achieving long-term financial success. I think that subtle shift in just how you view volatility is really important in terms of just enduring volatility versus trying to avoid it. And if you are, are able to endure it, that I think gives you the highest chance of compounding for the longest period of time, which is where the biggest money is made in this industry yeah so i guess in terms of a person's ability to stomach that volatility or that risk and to to what level they're able to to stomach it can really be extremely important to their ultimate returns but it's i mean something that's mentioned in the book is that that can often be simply a symptom of where and when they were born for example you know if they were born or if their formative years, 18 to 24, for example, were in the financial crisis, they're going to view global markets very differently to someone that was born uh, when stock markets were rising. I, I wonder, so that because the question that, that then comes to me is, you know, are these people able to 
move away from that mindset that they're innately kind of given because of when their formative years were? Or is that simply, no, they're stuck with those and that's the way they behave? I, I, I do think in general, we are stuck with them. And we like every one of us is a prisoner to our own past. And if you grew up during the Great Depression, you're, you're by and large, on average, you're, you're, you are never going to shake that. If you came of age during the financial crisis, or if you are coming of age now during, the, during COVID-19, by and large, on average, you will never be able to shake that. Um, it just becomes fundamental of who we are. You know, if you were a soldier in World War II, do you do you ever do you ever get over that? Like, no, I, I don't. I don't think you do. I think it, it scars people uh, psychologically, and in a way that is true for everyone. Like, we all have different experience. My experience in the United States has been different from yours, uh, and, and and if we come from different generations, like everyone just has a very different view of the world, and everyone sees the world through this tiny lens of what is relative to what else is at. But we all view the tiny lens that we view it through as a model of this is how the world works because this is what I have seen individually. And what, I'm, what, I'm, what everyone has experienced individually is always more powerful than what you might read about secondhand. So I can try to be open-minded and try to learn about what it was like to live through the Great Depression. But I, but I didn't live through it. So even if I try to read about it, try to put myself in their shoes, I don't have the emotional scar tissue that is left over from actually experiencing that. And the same is true for things that I have experienced individually that others haven't. So I think the takeaway from this is just realizing uh, that no one is crazy. Like we all have a different view of how the economy, how the stock market works. And that view is largely just based off of our own life experiences. And realizing people who are equally smart, equally educated, informed can come to different conclusions because they see the world through a different lens is really important in investing. And I actually think a lot of the times that when there is an economic debate or a financial debate about, you know, is the stock cheap? Yes or no. Is this asset allocation good? Yes or no. Lots of those debates are not actually arguments. They're just people who are, uh, you know, showing you that they have a different view of the world because they've had a different experience. So, I mean, one example of this, gold as an investment became very popular after the financial crisis when the Federal Reserve and central banks were printing a lot of money after the financial crisis in 2008. And the demographic that gold was most appealing to were baby boomers who came of age during the 70s and 80s when inflation was very high. My generation, the you know, p- people who were born in the 1980s, we did not you know, gold is not appealing to us at all because my generation has never experienced inflation ever. I can read about it. I can try to imagine what's like, but I don't have the emotional scar tissue of sitting in, in gasoline lines in the 1970s or watching my paycheck disintegrate week after week because we had double digit inflation. I didn't experience that. But for someone who did, they their views on future inflation are very different from mine, even if we have the same information. So I think just realizing that you know, if you have someone who's saying inflation is the risk and another person who says, what are you talking about? It's probably not a risk. That's often not because they have different information. It's just because they've lived different experiences in life. And this is, I think, the most common cause of economic financial investing debates in this world. Yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder then to what extent it's useful to be at least sort of self-aware about these preconceived ideas that we have because of where we've grown up in the formative years that we've looked at uh, global markets. Because it struck me when reading that actually I've never really sat there and kind of considered what, or, or at least where my preconceived ideas about certain asset classes or certain markets come from. Once you start to do that, maybe you're then able to view uh, markets within a slightly different prism. I, I think what's also common is that no matter your experiences, I think you probably tend to view that this is true for everyone. Everyone tries, tends to view their unique experiences as normal. I mean, this is true for myself. I was born in 1983 in the United States. So you can kind of you know, put together a broad uh, view of my life of what I've experienced in, in the economy. I was born into a middle-class family. I'm co- I have college-educated parents. You can kind of like just from that little that I've told you, you can piece together like probably what I've, the view that I've seen in the world. And to me, that view is normal because I've lived it. And that's what my peers lived and my, my siblings lived, my parents lived. That, that is the normal view to me is a white American male born in the early 1980s to college-educated parents. That's my view of normal. You can imagine someone who was born in the 1920s in a, in a different, let's say born in the 1920s in Berlin. Uh, very, very different view of what, of what a normal world looks like to them. So I, I, yeah, I, I think when you view your experience as always normal, then you get, it's hard to, it, it becomes hard to anticipate that a different world 
could apply to you. And I think this is where a lot of surprise comes when people, you know, have their view of what normal is and they extrapolate it to say that is what normal is going to be in the future. And then they experience something very different, very shocking, very surprising that may have been normal to someone else. I mean, one example, we, we, my wife and I were talking about this in the United States. We have not experienced any sort of that in the United States since the Civil War, 150, 60 odd years ago. Uh, very different to someone growing up in Europe, of course, or Japan, or many other places around the world. And the mere thought of having combat on U.S. soil is so completely, utterly foreign to us that I think if it ever were happen, and I pray it doesn't, but if it did, people in the United States would completely lose their minds because it is so foreign to us versus I think where someone, again, in a lot of places in Europe and Japan and around the world, it's not that it would not be shocking, but it, is mo- it, 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 it probably seems more probable if you or your ancestors have dealt with that in a way that people in the United States have not. And therefore, I think just that again just gets to our view of us in the United States, never having a war in your backyard is normal. Uh, and to other people, having a constant war in your yard is normal. So I think when you have a very different view of what you expect in the future, it just leads to a lot of support. Yeah, yeah, completely. Well, I completely agree. Um, and we, we've kind of touched on risk a little bit there, uh, namely volatility. But if if I move us on to a theme that is given a chapter heading in your book, Luck and Risk, uh, it's a relationship actually described as siblings in the book, I think. So two factors relatively sort of inextricably linked, I suppose. Um, but firstly, you describe luck as, as far more influential than most are willing to give it credit. Um, firstly, why why is that? Well, I think, you know, as investors, we are keenly aware of risk and we talk about risk all day long. We try to manage for risk. That's what we're, that's what we're doing as investors trying to manage risk. And we rarely luck, but I think and luck are actually the opposite sides of the same coin. They are very close. Both risk and luck are the idea that there are things in the world that can happen to you that have a, that are outside of your, that have a bigger impact on outcomes than any can do intentionally. That's what risk is. That's also what luck is. But we tend to ignore luck in investing more than we should because if I say that you, Hayden, are lucky, uh, I, I, I kind of jerk. I kind of look like maybe I'm jealous of you. I'm, I'm bitter. I'm cynical. If I'm in luck to you, I just look kind of mean. And if I ascribe luck to myself, then I have a hard time looking myself in the mirror in the morning. I want to believe that the things that I have going for me are things that I caused and I did myself. Because if I don't believe that, then I don't think that those things are sustainable. So it is much easier to discount and ignore luck than it is to think about and be aware of risk. But they are, I think they occur in equal amounts in the world and they're equally influential, but one is just much more easy to ignore over time. And that's why I think luck is probably the more important side of that, just because we're not, it's easy to ignore. Like people understand risk. Um, but what, like, ha, ha, like, like you know, just, just for one example, like a lot of fund managers will report risk adjusted returns. People have won the Nobel Prize for the you know, like broad concepts about risk-adjusted returns. No one reports or talks about or thinks about luck-adjusted returns. It just would never happen. And even when I bring that concept up, people laugh, laugh like, ha-ha, luck-adjusted returns. But I'm like, no, people, like, people think about risk, risk-adjusted returns. Why do we not do the same for luck? If we know that these concepts are virtually identical, just in the opposite direction, uh, but there's such a lopsided stance on how we view and think about uh, luck that I think it becomes easy to ignore. And when it's easy to ignore, it's when we're most likely to be fooled by it. Yeah, I mean, completely. And actually, uh, you give a really great example of uh, Bill Gates in the book, uh, which actually kind of brought home the impact of luck for me, I think, within within the book. It kind of made it made it real and, and, and less abstract, I suppose. I wonder whether you could share that with the listeners. Yeah, I just share the story. That is well known. I didn't, I didn't come up with the story. And Bill Gates has taught himself, but Bill Gates went to one of the only high schools in the entire world that had a computer. Uh, it was, it was, it was the, the lakeside school just outside of Seattle. And it was, of course it was just kind of dumb luck that he ended up there. His parents did not send him there because it had a computer. They sent him to the school because it was a good school nearby. And it just happened to be the only, one of the only high schools in the United States that had a computer. Uh, Bill Gates describes how important this was. He said at, at a, a, a graduation, uh, a speech that he gave several years ago, he said, quote, if there was no lakeside school, there would be no Microsoft. Now, look, is Bill Gates smart, hardworking, ambitious? My gosh, yes. He's one of the smartest, most hardest working, ambitious people of modern times, like period, full stop. But was he also lucky? 
I think by his own admission, yes, I mean, of course he was. He went to one of the only high schools in the world that had a, that had a computer. So you can, like both those things can coexist. If I say that Bill Gates was lucky, I'm not also saying that he's not smart and hardworking. Of course he is. But there is also this element of luck that is much easier to discount and ignore. And this becomes important when we are trying to look up as, to uh, people for, as role models and say, well, you know, if someone says, well, I want to be the next Bill Gates, so let me try to copy it. If you realize that there is an element of luck in there that is impossible to copy, impossible to emulate, then I think it just makes the idea of a role model, you know, I, I think what, what we should take away from role models and anti-role models too, is are the much more broader things that are to, to broader people rather than the hyper-specific, how can I be like that person? It's true for investors as well, for people who are trying to emulate Warren Buffett or Benjamin Graham or George Soros, whoever it is, to realize that you cannot emulate their luck. You just can't do that. And that doesn't mean that we can't emulate anything that they do. We just have to be careful sure that we are pulling out the lessons from them that are very broad and are likely repeatable to our own behaviors and our own circumstances. Yeah. So for those of us investing now, then, if this relationship of, of luck and risk is, is crucial, how do we work out, and this, this might be an unfair question, but um, I'm interested to get your opinion on it. How do we work out what investing strategies work? You know, when we assess our past historical performance, if we have to adjust for luck and we have to adjust for risk, you know, how do, how do we do that? How do we get a true sense of how we performed? I, I honestly don't know what we can. Uh, I, I, I truly don't think that there is a way that we can find luck and risk in a way that, you know, makes us say, okay, let's, let's take Warren Buffett, for example. What percentage was luck and what percentage? I don't think we can quantify that. We know it's we know it's powerful, but I just don't think that we can do it. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it is impossible to rerun Bill Gates' life if he did not go to Lakeside. You can't, you can't model that. So, so how do we know? Well, we, we don't. And I think that, again, is why it is easy to overlook these topics, even if we know they're powerful. So that's, it's a difficult thing to do. And then you have all these other examples of, I mean, uh, someone, I, I mentioned in the book about the story of Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the wealthiest men of all time. His net worth adjusted for inflation was like a quarter of a trillion dollars. So you, it's easy to look at him and say, Cornelius Vanderbilt is the most successful, smartest businessman in the history of humanity. That's, that's an argument you can make. But if you actually go back and read about how he did business and how he got wealthy, the main thrust of his business model was to break the law. That was a lot of why he became so successful is because he was willing to break the law when his competitors were not. Uh, and, he, and he was totally open about this, about how he was willing to break the law, how he could get around it, how he could kind of appease judges, et cetera, et cetera. That's a big reason of why he got successful. Now, you could easily imagine a different story of Cornelius Vanderbilt where we don't look at him back today as a successful uh, tycoon, but we actually view him as a crook who ended up in prison. Like th That story easily could have happened. Uh, easily could have happened. The fact that it didn't, I think, makes it easy to just focus on what did happen and discount kind of the luck and risk, you know, balance that happened that is only, that is, that even in hindsight, is like such a thin line that you don't really know where it begins and ends. So even, even in hindsight, when we're looking at these things, it's very difficult to say nothing about trying to piece that together with any sort of foresight. Yeah, and, and to move us on and to, to focus on another sort of factor that I guess is is often overlooked, similar to similar to luck, but is equally sort of impactful and powerful, uh, and that's compounding. You dedicate a, a chapter to this in the book as well, and uh, you use the, the another fascinating example of uh, Warren Buffett. Everyone's familiar with him, but you uh, you give the example, and you might have to correct me on this, but but I'll give it a go. So he'd actually began investing in his 30s, if he'd actually began investing in his 30s, sorry, and retired at 60, uh, arguably like most people would. I, I think that's sort of a pretty normal investment uh, investment lifespan, uh, as opposed to having started from around 10 years old. Uh, I mean, it was sort of prepubescent years that he was actually investing, which, again, was something that I learned reading the book, which, which was pretty astounding. Uh, but if he'd done that, if he'd lived that more normal lifestyle, he'd have made around 0.1% of his total net worth. So why do you think compounding, given it can have that bigger impact, or even simply time, I guess we, we don't have to use the word compounding, we can literally use the word time, the, the time that you leave your investments to accrue, uh, to accrue that interest. I mean, 
why is it so underappreciated? Well, look, is Warren Buffett a great investor? Yes, of course. Like, like it would be ridiculous to say anything otherwise. But we know from the simple math that I lay out in the book that you just hinted at, the simple math is the reason that he is worth $90 billion is because he's been investing for 80 years. Uh, that, that is why, like, if he had earned the same average annual returns, but he started investing at a normal age, like in your 20s, and retired at 60, 65, like a normal person, you would have never heard of him. He never would have become a household name. His net worth never would have amounted to anything worth discussing, even if he had the exact same average annual returns, the same investing skill. And I think that explanation, that 99.9% .9 of Warren Buffett's success can be explained through time. Uh, it's just not intuitive to people. Compounding, even if you are a smart person who understands the math, compounding is never intuitive. Like the results of it are never intuitive. And I think that's the, that's the perfect example. So when we try to look at Warren Buffett and say, how did he do it? We go into a lot of depth about how he thinks about business models, market cycles, moats, management teams, those kind of things. And rarely do we just take a step back and say, hey, by the way, the reason he's done this, where these returns came from, is just because he started at 10 and he continues at it through age 90. That's, that's, where, that's where the dollar amount of his net worth has come from. And I think since that explanation is just not, A, it's too simple, and B, it's just not intuitive, it becomes easy to overlook in favor of things that seem more intuitive, like how successful of an investor he is. Um, it, it, and, 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 I, and I think that is why, you know, that's, that's part of why no one has been able to replicate Warren Buffett's success, is because they try to replicate the parts that in some ways they can't like you can't like unless you are 10 years old and you are and you are going to live through 90 you cannot replicate the success that he has had even if you can earn the exact same average annual returns so i think that is a big reason why someone like him is such an anomaly is because even if we could replicate his intelligence we can't replicate the amount of time he's been doing. Yeah, before. yeah, completely agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's just one of those concepts that it seems that for, for a human brain, I guess, because as you say, it's not intuitive, it's just difficult to comprehend, I suppose. Um, and uh, I, I want to, I know we're sort of wrestling through the various themes. I'm, I, it's probably obvious now, but what I've done is pick, picked out my favorite chapters and then tried to dig into those. But uh, by the end of this interview, we will have covered about three of the, the the chapters and and not in great detail so there's plenty more there for people to go and read but um a line from the book reads good investing is not necessarily about making good decisions it's about consistently not screwing up so is this essentially how people stay wealthy and the emphasis is on on stay there yeah it's just the observation that you know getting rich and staying rich are two very different things getting rich requires optimism swinging for the fences taking a risk being a long that's what getting rich requires. Staying rich requires almost the polar opposite. It requires like amount of pessimism and paranoia about the short run, that the short run is going to be filled with setbacks and disappointments and recessions and bear markets and pandemics that you have to be able to put up with and endure and deal with and manage in, a, in kind of a pessimistic way. Like you, like you want to have enough cash to get you through the next recession. You want to avoid debt to make sure that you're never in over your head. That's like a level of pessimism and you have to match that with long-term optimism in order to do very well over time. And there are actually a reasonable number of people who are very good at getting rich and have no ability at staying rich over time. And there are very different skills that require different, different skill sets. You need to manage and nurture those skills in, in different standalone ways. That is difficult for people. But I think in any long-term earning success, you will see people that have that barbell personality. Um, one other way to think about this is saving like a pessimist and investing like an optimist. It seems optim it seems like like it seems contradictory, but you need to have both of those skills in equal amounts in order to do well over a long period of time. Yeah, and the great example in the book, or at least one of them, is Jesse Livermore, that the, the infamous trader who made a fortune in the nineteen twenty nine crash, only to lose it all a few years later. So he's used an example of someone that is obviously very good at getting wealthy, but staying wealthy obviously wasn't uh, one of his fortes. He had no ability whatsoever to stay wealthy. He 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 made several fortunes and he lost all of them th throughout his life. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating story, and of course, well known he. His life ended uh, by by killing himself after the last time that he went broke. So for Je Jesse Livermore, you know, one of the most he is at at equal times the most successful investor of all time, and he was so unsuccessful that he committed suicide because of it. It's just a fascinating story from end to end. Yeah, no, it completely is. I mean, so s survival in the investment world, or just staying alive in terms of having your investments uh, and and not losing it all because then that allows your returns to count, compound over time. Like that, that's the key, I suppose. And that's, that's a key lesson that we take from the book. But which 
uh, if you can pick one, and again, this could be an unfair question, but which investor best exemplifies that staying power, that that mindset? Have you, have you got a favorite example? Look, it's cliche, but I, I think Buffett, uh, I think Warren Buffett is, is probably the best example of that because he just has the amount of endurance. And, you know, I think one way, if there is a way to separate luck from skill, is that people who have thrived in different environments, different eras, different economies, different kinds of investments, if you can survive in that broad, if, if you can thrive, I should say, in a broad, diverse range of environments, you are, you are probably someone who's going to have much more skill than luck. So I think just by the fact that he's been doing it for the longest time and he has survived every up and down that you can think about in investing, survived both financially and psychologically, uh, probably makes him the best example of this just by the fact that he is 90 years old and still doing it. And he started investing uh, you know, before World War II is when he started investing and he has survived everything that has happened since then probably makes him the, the grand champion at this point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, completely. <laughs> Hard to argue with that one. Um, so before we move on to our quick fire questions, uh, where can we find the book? Where's the best place to get it? You know, it's, 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 it's probably available uh, virtually anywhere that you can buy books right now. Of course, Amazon, other places. It is in, in many bookstores around the world, physical bookstores. I don't know if all of them are open right now because of COVID, but hopefully you should be able to buy it wherever you buy books. Great. All right, then. Well, uh, so the quick fire questions then is a, a final sort of two minute round, I'd say max. And simply, it's a lighthearted way to end the episode. You can answer in as little as one sentence or even one word, if you like. Question one, what is the top mistake investors make? Not being introspective about yourself enough and not realizing your own flaws, your own biases, your own misconceptions. Instead, you focus on other people's mistakes without realizing that behavioral finance is the study of you. Yeah, got it. Okay, question two. Where do you go for investment or economic insights? Do you read a specific publisher, for example? I read the normal news sources, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Bloomberg, but most of what I read has nothing to do with investing. I, my, the, the question that I want to answer is how people think. And you can learn about those and you can become a better investor about those topics by reading about psychology, sociology, politics, military history, all these other fields that seem like they have nothing to do with investing. Yeah, completely. Okay, so question three, what's the most memorable moment from your career to date? This, this is a tricky one, but uh, let's see what you say. Uh, so the, the first time that I gave a big speech uh, that was international, it was in front of thousands of people in Johannesburg, South Africa. That was probably the coolest moment of my, of my career. That was, that was, that was kind of, it was, it was so much fun to do that in front of a big audience uh, for something that I never thought I would have the ability to do. That was really cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, okay, penultimate question. A top tip for your younger self. Don't worry. Things will be okay. It's not that everything's going to be perfect, but things will be fine. Worry less. Enjoy more. Yeah, definitely solid advice. Um, and the final question, this is the question that we always on, ask on Opto. Uh, we're always looking to speak to the people that are outperforming index and market returns. And obviously, you've had lots of experience talking to the people that are doing that. Uh, so what's an investor's best source of alpha? Uh, and if I can explain that question a bit better, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, wh where do you think the great investors derive their outperformance? Is there a favorite uh, source of alpha that you could point to? I think they understand the difference between patience and stubbornness. Patience is you have to have, you have to give your strategy time to work out and realize that your strategy is going to have periods where it is not favored, but that's okay. You're just patient about it. Stubbornness is the inability to change your mind when the facts have changed. Uh, those two are very difficult to tell the difference from in real time, but the best investors can tell the difference. They are, they're willing to be patient when they need to be patient and they're willing to change their mind when they need to change their mind. That's probably the biggest common factor between them great all right well i think that's the perfect place to to end the episode uh well all i can say is thanks very much for joining us morgan it was a real pleasure it's been a lot of fun thank you very much thanks for listening everyone just a quick note before we sign off if you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets this might be of interest Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time.